November 21st, 1931, the height of the Great Depression. In the midst of traditional entertainment, a small struggling studio would introduce the world to a name that would forever be associated with fear. The studio was universal, and the name was Frankenstein. It's alive! It's alive! When unknown actor Boris Karloff made his unforgettable entrance, the terrifying face of Frankenstein's monster etched itself into world consciousness forever. The movie gave birth to the American horror film, and for the next two decades, the great icons of terror made their way onto the silver screen. One by one, they came to life through the combined imaginations of filmmakers, actors, and a single man whose makeup skills and artistic versatility would literally create universal monsters. His name was Jack Pierce. He's probably one of the most important people in the history of monster movies. And yet also at the same time, he's one of the most unknown people. He refined what you could do, where it made a remarkable change in what the audience was getting and what indeed the audience came to expect. This one guy created a stable of like amazing characters. Jack Pierce's Frankenstein is, to me, is the only Frankenstein. And that's like the defining moment for, for a makeup artist. Yeah, he created the Frankenstein monster. He created the Bride of Frankenstein. He created the Wolfman. He created the different mummies. He really created some of the greatest screen characters ever. In the makeup field, he's considered the father of the universal monster. Well, in the very early days of cinema, you had the theatrical tradition that actors did their own makeup, you know, the job makeup artist didn't specifically even exist. Ron Chaney was the first to bring a finesse and an imagination to these techniques, uh, using tons of nose putty wires to pull his face and everything. I'm amazed when I see the makeups that Lon Chaney Sr. did at the time that they were doing them. The Phantom of the Opera that he did still hasn't been topped in any Phantom of the Opera makeup. Jack Pierce looked at this and said, wow, with simple materials, this guy could do great stuff. That's where I'm headed. And that's what he did. The makeup that really brought Jack Pierce to the attention of Carl Emley in Universal was his 1926 makeup in a movie called The Monkey Talks. Even today, when you look at it, it's a really brilliant makeup. It rivals anything that John Chambers did in Planet of the Apes. But then he came back and he did The Man Who Laughs at Universal in 1928. And Pierce created this amazing, ghoulish, freaky kind of makeup. It became so iconographic that it became the inspiration for the Joker, the most popular and well-known villain in all of comic books. And apparently, Pierce was taken under Carl Lemley's wing uh, to head up the Universal Makeup Department. Because he was the head of Universal Makeup, he would be involved in all the films Universal were turning out in the 1930s and early 40s. He isn't losing sight of the fact that he is a makeup artist, and that means making up everybody. When they decided to make films of the classic horror novels, being Dracula and Frankenstein in the early 30s, I think Pierce really saw an opportunity to do something great. And of course, Dracula was the first one made. And although he actually worked on Dracula and worked with Bela Lugosi, apparently the two of them never really got on very well. And Lugosi himself insisted still on doing some of his own makeup. In 1931, Jack Pierce is very disappointed when Dracula is released, and even though it's a huge success, he's not really credited with creating the character. Although Dracula came first, we actually really think of the Universal Cycle as beginning with the Frankenstein monster, because it's the most visually amazing thing. Audiences have never seen anything like that before. One of the sketches that was done by the art department at Universal showed it as a mechanical robot made out of some kind of a metal. Pierce didn't go in that direction, thankfully. And of course, he doesn't bear any resemblance to the actual description in Mary Shelley's book, but what he created was something that was perfect for its time. Karloff had just a great face for it, especially in the original film when he was a starving actor and he was very gaunt and cadaverous looking. After work at night, he and Karloff would devise the makeup. During that time, which was about a three-week stretch, they tested different things. They tried all sorts of little quirky things and then settled upon one thing and then that, that was the look for the character. There were no prosthetic rubber pieces that were stuck on. This was started from scratch every time Karloff sat in the chair. 
Jack Pierce surrounded himself with reference books on medicine, criminology, electronics, all these things. He looked at hundreds of pictures of criminals and determined that there's a criminal look. And Pierce emphasized that look in this movie. <laughs> Jack Pierce tells the story about how he came up with the flat head, which never made any sense to me. He says he studied the way that you know surgeons work in ancient Egyptian you know burial things, and decided that you know uh, Frankenstein, not being a trained surgeon, would take the easiest route to get a man's brain out, which is to saw the top of his head off and take the brain out, replace it with the other one, and put it back on. Therefore, he made it flat like a lid of a box. I don't know if he tried to make up an answer after the fact, you know, in where that square head came from, but. It works. It makes it instantly recognizable as Frankenstein's monster. Ha! Karloff had to be on for the ride, you know, to be endure the hours in the chair and on set and, and any of the pain and, and scars that might have been left, you know, but they understood what it took and, and signed on for it 100%. You look at movie monsters in the 30s and their faces move. And it's because you've got this craftsman painstaking work of gluing every single bit individually. And it's a lot easier to project through that than it is just through a mask. Jack Pierce created the classic monsters with primitive techniques. I mean, cotton and collodion. Collodion is this horrible liquid plastic that's 24% ether. He built it up with layers of cotton, painting collodion over it, blending it in, using Q-tips or something to get the edges of the cotton to uh, you know, disappear into the skin, and he built up the head the same way. And it was time consuming. Karloff talks about getting into Universal Studios at 3.30 in the morning to prepare for the makeup. It was more horrible taking it off. This stuff adhered like epoxy. I've heard that Karloff sometimes slept in the makeup so he wouldn't have to come and do the makeup the next day. And then of course, how would he be brought to life? The famous, everyone calls them bolts, but they're actually electrodes on the neck. Pierce added those. We know that he put the electrodes on with spirit gum because Karloff has often remarked in the interviews that, you know, he has scars where the electrodes were. He's made this cranium. He's used wax on the eyelids to give them a heavy look. But how the hell did he cave in one side of the guy's face? And I looked at that for ages when I was a kid. And, you know, when finally somebody says to you, Karloff had false teeth. Jack Pierce just said, take him out. I think one of the great things about the Frankenstein monster makeup is it does look like a walking dead man. You've never seen Karloff look more cadaverous than he does in Frankenstein. There is not a makeup artist alive that wouldn't like to create something as dynamic as the original Frankenstein. Nobody's ever been able to duplicate that, and everybody's tried. <laughs> It's quite telling that Boris Karloff, many years later, would always credit Pierce as the man who created the Frankenstein monster. Karloff said, I was the person who wore the suit, I was the person who filled out the suit, but it was Jack Pierce who actually created the look and the feel of the monster. It comes together in such a way that it almost feels like it always existed. That's how great it is, like the Mona Lisa. Jack Pierce, after Frankenstein, was a superstar on the Universal lot, and they immediately put into production a, a film about the mummy. When you look at the opening scenes in that film of Karloff coming back from the tomb, wrapped in the bandages, and you can actually see the little globules of earth and dust and, and, and stuff that Pierce meticulously painted into those bandages. It is just the, probably the best mummy ever. We basically cooked the linen so that it would have a very aged and fragile feeling to it, and he wrapped it around vertically, horizontally, and diagonally around Boris Karloff. He literally spends hours getting him into this, so much so that he has to sort of be wheeled around. Pierce did the whole makeup, top of his head to bottom of his feet, and it took eight hours. And considering he's on screen so little, that image is massively iconic. One of the great moments in the history of cinema. It looks real because, it, in effect, it is. When I was a kid, seeing the mummy and then knowing that that's the same guy that was Frankenstein, it was like one of those, wait, how did they, how did he look like Frankenstein? Now he looks like a mummy. Carl Freund rather undershoots the mummy. I think he was given probably a better job than he was expecting. Ah! You can tell that the mummy makeup will do all sorts of things that it's not required to do. 
But then he goes one step further, and suddenly you have Karloff in this, in this incredible old age makeup, where you really can believe he's 3,000 years old. And I think probably it's the Ardath Mayer makeup that I always think of Pierce's greatest moment. That's a stretch and stipple technique that we still use today, where you, you stretch a section of the skin, and you put latex on it, you dry it and let it go, and it contracts into a bunch of wrinkles. I did the exact same thing to Scott Reiniger in Dawn of the Dead. You know, that was a Jack Pierce mummy makeup on the Scott Reiniger zombie. We've seen many mummy movies since the original, and to me, nothing's as effective as what he did. It's almost like, you know, with all the tools of the trade, you know, we've lost some of the magic because we can do anything. And I think with his limitations, he created stuff that, you know, obviously withstood the test of time. Pierce and Karloff had a, a mutual respect for each other, and Pierce didn't always get that. Jack made up Boris and The Raven and an Old Dark House and just all these mov amazing movies that he did with him. And, and, uh, they still, you know, many years later, still had that respect and admiration for each other. I don't think anyone had quite pulled off horror in the contemporary world until the Black Cat did. What I find interesting about the makeup is this sort of fierce, logical, geometric character. Angular hair, angular shoulders. He's a piece of walking geometry who's like a prop in a modernist house, which is the polar opposite of what was going on in the Gothic films, but equally frightening. <laughs> of Frankenstein, the actual makeup on Elsa Lancaster is really uh, another great iconic makeup. This is an example, you see, of Jack Pierce. He always said he used scientific, but he often used cultural references. In the script, it says she should look like an Egyptian mummy. Jack Pierce didn't bother with that. Let's make her look like Nefertiti. It's not the first thing that you'd think of if you were going to design a makeup for a woman who was brought back from the dead with electricity. And yet, like the monster, it comes together in a very artistic way. And Elsa Lanchester, you know, she wrote a famous account of being made up by Jack Pierce. Describes, he's dressed in this button-up surgeon's outfit, with slick back hair, looking, as someone said, like a Greek barber. She said he really enjoyed these kind of uh, tortuous uh, applications of makeup at five in the morning. By now, he was living the part. He also created the amazing hairstyle, which they put up in a cage as Elsa described it. And the only hint that this is a corpse is the stitching around her jaw, which James Whale wisely uh, features in the low angle shots. A lot of people don't ever even realize that Frankenstein went through incarnations of makeup stages from movie to movie. The transition of the makeup from Frankenstein to Bride of Frankenstein, where the hair is singed back a little bit more and you see a little bit more of his forehead and there's the, the burn on the cheek, and then in Son of Frankenstein, that you know, he's got this big, massive chest. You know, those are just great little touches. Good. Makeups that work on one person won't necessarily work on another. I think Frankenstein's monster never looked as good as it did on Karloff in the first film, and again, because of how thin Karloff was at that point. You know, by the time it was in the Son of Frankenstein, Karloff had could eat and then put on some weight. And he was also older, so his face was fuller and it just didn't, didn't look as good. You know, the worst was when they put it on Bela Lugosi. At that point, he actually had switched to a slip rubber headpiece and it wasn't fabricated on a daily basis and it didn't look as good, but again, his face was so wrong. Oh, yeah, when they bring Cheney in, it's defaulted back to the original Frankenstein monster look. So the way that there's a change between Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, and Son of Frankenstein, suggesting the character evolving, all that's just been wiped out. And Cheney is required to look as much like Boris Karloff in the first film as possible. And that's the look that then carried on for Lugosi and Glenn Strange and Eddie Parker and Herman Munster and yeah, anyone else who's ever got into that get up. Where Pearson hits it out of the park in Son of Frankenstein is with Igor. And Igor, for my money, is probably Lugosi's second greatest screen character of all time. And it's fantastic and such a great marriage of actor and makeup artist. Igor has a broken neck. So Pierce created a rubber appliance that had a, a broken sort of bone in the neck, and that was strapped onto Bela Lugosi's neck, and apparently uh, it was secured with a, some kind of band under his arm. 
And then a beard was applied around that with Yak's hair, Jack Pierce's favorite kind of hair. That's where Pierce is really showing his skills at doing great hair work on characters. And he laid that whole beard in himself, the wig, and then would trim it every day to give Lugosi that great sort of semi-hunchback kind of character. And then he was given a set of really nasty teeth that include fangs. That's the one time that Bela Lugosi actually wore fangs in a movie, not for Dracula, but for Igor. So that was a really iconic makeup by Jack Pierce. <laughs> I always was fond of the wolf man. I mean, I like that whole concept of an animal and a man combined into one kind of creature. Pierce had created basically the same makeup in 1935 for Henry Hull for the Werewolf of London, but Henry Hull didn't want to wear it. It was too much makeup for him. It was uncomfortable, and he wanted more of his face to show. And the makeup he did on Henry Hull, one could easily look at it and go, well, it doesn't look like a werewolf to me, but it was, it was a lovely approach very stylized, but it's lovely to compare it with what he did to Lon Chaney Jr. in The Wolfman. The Wolfman became Chaney's baby. He was very invested in this character, which is good because the makeup was very arduous. Jack Pierce was a master with hair work. When you think all of that was pretty much hand laid, it's incredible. Yak's hair was applied in layers and trimmed and then scorched with a curling iron and curled and blended. He never had upper teeth in. The Wolfman only wore lower dentures, so it jutted out his lower teeth as if it's like a, a dog or a wolf. But one thing that Jack Pierce couldn't do every day was completely model the Wolfman's nose from scratch. So that is the one appliance Jack Pierce definitely did use on these films, which all indications are was created by Ellis Merman Sr. Jack Pierce would secretly have these sculpture and molds made from impressions of the actors, and he would bring them to my father. My father would run the foam latex and the molds make the pieces for him. Jack Pierce really didn't want to let it out to the other makeup people that he was unfamiliar with those materials. They would literally shoot time-lapse photography. Jack Pierce had to run in between each successive makeup change and apply makeup and glue hair and then go back in and glue a little bit more hair. He had to sort of reverse engineer what that look looked like and then build into it. There's talks that it took, you know, 10, 12 hours of, of Cheney literally having to sit in that chair while they would shoot that transition and the, that progression of makeups. By the time he did Frankenstein Meets a Wolfman, which was the second time the Wolfman appeared, he really just made it perfect. And I don't think it was ever better than that after that. that that's the perfect Wolfman makeup. The mummies in the 1940s were totally different from the 1932 mummy. First of all, they're not really the same type of film at all, and the makeups are totally different. With Tom Tyler in The Mummy's Hand, which is 1940, he's really creating a mummy similar to the Imhotep mummy that Karloff played in 1932. The three Cheney films, Mummy's Tomb, Mummy's Ghost, Mummy's Curse, he's really doing a different kind of character altogether. And Pierce by then is doing a really different turn on the character that he had done with either Karloff or Tom Tyler. Cheney was not enjoying being made up as Karras. So for the third Karras performance by Lon Chaney Jr., Pierce fashioned a rubber mask. But I think the big difference between, say, a Karloff and a Chaney, Karloff was willing to sit for hours being tortured like no other person was willing to do, and other actors were not as willing to do that. So it really, it's not a criticism of Chaney so much as a compliment to someone like Boris Karloff. This is one of the mummy's curse faces that Lon Chaney Jr. wore in uh, The Mummy's Curse that Jack Pierce did. Now, Jack gave me this around 1963, and it's just simple latex, so he did use rubber, even though he said he didn't. Now, he didn't use appliance rubber. That's what he was really talking about, but this, this is rubber, and uh, you know, you can see all the wrinkles and, well, all the stuff in here, and you can see all the detail uh, that's in this mask, but it's, uh, it's one of my favorite things in the world. And as far as I know, I know Rick Baker, a lot of people have checked on this, and I think this is the only surviving piece of Jack's work now. Check the mega voltage. 25,000. In the mid-1940s, Universal was looking at ways of saving money and making as much money as they could from their monsters. And so they started churning out House of Dracula and House of Frankenstein. And suddenly, Pierce had to work on three or four monsters in one movie. Jack Pierce 
had to make a Frankenstein monster from Glenn Strange, do the Wolfman on Lon Chaney Jr., and uh, create a Dracula makeup for John Carradine. And there was a lot of pressure on Jack Pierce to accommodate the actors and, of course, the production company. It was take, take too much time to do Cotton and Collodion. One can easily imagine actors who have been through a 12-hour makeup might well, the next time they come back, beg, you know, is there any way you can reduce the time or can you use something that's less corrosive? And unfortunately, Jack Pierce had never signed a contract with the studio and had been there 19 years as the department head by 1947, and he was let go in favor of a new breed of younger people who could get things done faster and quicker. You know, Jack Pierce is a guy who, you know, at the time, you know, he, he did his thing, he did it better than anybody, and, and he knew no other way, you know, and, and, and the movie, and the industry changed. He did all the Frankenstein movies except Abbott Costello meets Frankenstein. In that film, Bud Westmore brought in the masks and basically used the over-the-head rubber mask approach to all the monsters. And you can see the difference. The makeups do not stand up anywhere near as well as when Pierce was doing them. Then, then that was a whole new start of, uh, you know, how makeup, uh, makeup and prosthetics and, and specialty characters were going to be handled for the future. When Jack Pierce left Universal, he did independent movies, he worked a lot in television, then he ended up doing B-films. He ended up gluing monofilament to Mr. Ed's lip, you know, it's like, that's terrible. To my knowledge, he was even asked back to Universal in an underling position in the Bud Westmore era, but declined it. One of the sad things about Jack Pierce was that at the end of his career, he was forgotten. He died in the mid-60s in, in near poverty, um, in, in, in near isolation. Nobody remembered who he was. Nobody really cared who he was. You know, I think at his funeral, somebody told me that there were, I think, four or five people when he passed away. You know, for somebody who was so inspirational to so many, very few people showed up. Time had marched on. The horror film had marched on. It's not like those movies were, were forgotten, but Jack Pierce was kind of forgotten. Took us about four hours in the morning, <laughs> put the Frankenstein face and the head on, Boris, and Hello, nearly Jack. an hour to take it off. Yes. The whole outfit weighed about 20, 35 pounds. Yeah, you know who that is, Boris. One of the leading makeup Jack artists Pierce. in motion pictures who flew down here from Angel's Camp, California, where he's working on the Ransom Broidy production, Bullwhip, your very good friend, Jack Pierce. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The oh, best yeah. makeup man in the world. Uh, well, Thank what you. What I owe him a lot. It's happened to so many makeup artists I know that they look back and it was either the Frankenstein makeup or the mummy or the wolfman that made them get up and decide that they wanted to do that. And I think his legacy is that he sowed that seed and this is decade upon decade upon decade later. His legacy is the inspiration of thousands and thousands of makeup people, thousands and thousands of horror fans and thousands and thousands of directors that watched those movies and were inspired by those movies. Nowadays, when we can do anything, that we still can't accomplish what he did, maybe that's why his stuff was so unique. My grandson, who knows who Frankenstein is, he's five years old, someday I'll show him the bust of Jack Pierce and say, see, the, he made him. You see how Grandpa makes these monsters? Well, he made this monster, and that's why I'm making my monsters. Halloween is a lasting tribute to Jack Pierce. When a kid dresses up like Frankenstein, he's dressing up in Jack Pierce's design. When a kid dresses up like the Wolfman, he's dressing up in Jack Pierce's design. Unfortunately, Jack didn't have children. He doesn't have that legacy to carry on, but he had these children that will outlast any children that he would have. He created these characters that outlived him and will outlive me, and people can see these a thousand years from now. You can look back and you can go, Universal Classic Monsters, there's a whole world there. Jack Pierce created that. <laughs>